everybody. Good morning, S. How are you? Sup, sup. All good, thank you. Good. I'm very happy to hear that. I see uh, you are fresh and full of the joys of spring, or rather, should we say autumn? Oh, yeah, I had to bring out my uh, my blankie scarf this morning. Made me <laughs> a little bit depressed. But you know what? what it is. Women are lucky because in winter you can have something like that. And, and it, it technically is a blankie. It's like you just carry around a blankie with you. Well, <laughs> guys can't do that. We, we can't do that, right? It's not our thing. Of course you can. One of these what, big guys. Yeah, yeah, why not? Uh, Rock it with uh, tracksuit bottoms and some white oh, scones. No. no, you can't do that. Not allowed. Or you could just pretend it's a Lesotho blanket. Um, I thought about that, but I don't think I'll pass very well for a like Basutu man. So Yeah, know. it might be appropriation, yeah. No, I might get into trouble for that. <laughs> How was your weekend? What did you do? Oh, all good. Um our house set, dog set. Fixed a swimming pool, got some sun because Saturday was amazing, sun wise. Yeah. That um, was, it was actually a really nice day. Yeah. So I schwitzed sh- it out while fixing a swimming pool for a few hours, okay. um, which I find quite therapeutic. I like fixing swimming pools. Must what be the lesbian in me. Yeah, it must be a big lesbian living inside you that you don't know about. Did you, uh, did you empty all the crap out of the filter and out of the, uh, the, the weir? Did you, yeah. did you clean out so, the pipes and backwash the pool and all of that mm-hmm. shit? Yeah, so mm-hmm. the, there's a leak. So it's bypassed at the moment with an above ground pipe that was yeah. causing some problems. Managed to fix that up. And uh, hey, presto, did some uh, some work. Um, caught up. Oh, I started watching Love is Blind Sweden. Oh, yeah? She said language is just something else. <laughs> I can't get it. Some of it sounds a bit Dutch, Afrikaans. Because I'm trying not to read the subtitles. Yeah. But, um, yeah, quite yeah. strange. Yeah, the Swedes are also very weird people. I mean, it, yeah. you know, that whole Scandinavian thing, it's almost a bit alien. I've, I've always thought that if there are two places on Earth where like aliens could have landed and mixed with humans and we wouldn't have known it, it would be Japan and like Sweden or Norway or, you know. Yeah. Very bizarre. Very bizarre. Okay, so that's the show where... What they 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 basically they're in different pods, they can't see each other. Then they propose. Yeah. Then they they go on like to a, a trip. I don't know where the Swedes will go. It's usually some kind of island or Mexico for the Americans. Um yeah. and they kind of have a honeymoon together before getting married. Then they go back to Stockholm and live but they still together. haven't seen each, they still haven't seen each other. No, man, on holiday they see each other. Okay, but before then they decide to go on holiday based on not seeing each other. Yeah. So the first time they see each other is Ugh. still at the pods, but outside the pods in this long runway where two doors open and they finally reveal to each other. And you no, can tell some people are highly disappointed. Yeah. Mm, I would be, it would be such a disaster for me because I'm very superficial, you know, I went to this housewarming party, a friend of mine uh, moved into a new place and, it was kind of a combination of his birthday and a, a housewarming. And um, he invited all these people. He told us that there was a dress code. And every, of course, I ignored the dress code. But um, yeah. I got there. And, and, and they were like such great looking people. Just everybody there was just, they all dressed really beautifully. Um, there were girls wearing hats. It, it was like really smart and lovely. And I thought, wow. You know? Yeah, I really like I like beautiful things and beautiful people and beautiful settings. And as you say, it was a lovely day. Like the ugly stuff really messes everything up, you know. <laughs> ugly people, <laughs> ugly things, ugly clothes, ugly places. Like why do they? Why do they allow it? They shouldn't. Uh, there should be no tolerance for ugly. So if I were in that show, I wouldn't. There's no way I'd be able to do it. Yeah, no. There, there are a lot of guys who are very superficial, and they admit it. So they put those in there, obviously, for entertainment value. Um, yeah. But they're all the assholes. That's the thing. Their personalities really? are shit. Yeah. Really? And they're the types of people you wouldn't want to marry. Mm, yeah, um, you see, that, that's, the, that's, probably, that's probably a very clever thing from the producer's point of view. They do that on purpose. Yes, of course. I mean, you, oh. you have your psychometric testing way before. And they always put in one or two who are kind of just 
borderline not well upstairs at all and mm. usually mess around the whole they mess the whole thing up by double dating and having girlfriends at home and things like that well i'll tell you what you, you better enjoy these kinds of shows while they last because you know people are going to get involved soon from the mental health side of things and they're going to be like oh no you can't put these people on because you're exploiting them and you you're, you're using their mental illness to make other people entertained and it's wrong and Soon they're going to stop that. I'm telling you. So that's already happened with Love on the Spectrum, another dating oh, really? show. That's and about that's people, all... people with autism and, and stuff, mm. right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so these people elect to be on the show. Um, in the first season, there was one girl who didn't seem that autistic on the surface, but um, she was very autistic. And she wasn't yeah. selected for the second show. And she uh, released a video saying, I know you guys have been asking why I'm not on the show. And it's because of too many people in the audience saying um, I was too normal. Oh. So, yeah, everyone knows that they choose people who are quite severely dyslexic. And then they do it all for entertainment value. Everyone well, knows. Who's signing up, they know. I mean, you and I are lucky we were in radio, right? I mean, you talk about... Uh... I've done a bit of TV as well, but uh, mostly radio. And um, someone in the comments here, Vyasan, I think it is, says, well, lucky you can't see our faces on the show. We might have to leave. I, I just imagine everyone who's listening to us every morning is just absolutely like, <laughs> 10 out of 10. I really do. I just assume everybody looks fantastic, that they're all dressed to the nines, that they would they'd walk into a a boardroom or a party or a, onto the deck of a yacht just looking splendid and you know i just don't, so don't spoil sure. don't spoil my game here by telling me that you're not i mean that would really ruin the friendship i actually don't i i watch everyone in the comments and um i i assume that they're either still horizontal and listening or watching on their phones they still got yeah. sleep in their eyes their hair's all over the place I, I see a completely different image. <laughs> no, I, I always assume the best. This is why I'd, I'd be useless at that show that you spoke about because I would I picture like this gorgeous human being talking to me from behind the curtain and she's got like, you know, perfect hair and skin and 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 just like magnificent in every way. And then and then some fucking troglodyte would walk out and I'd, I'd, just be, I'd be just horrified and disappointed. Not because, and I've got to say this over and over again, but really, I I feel in my mind's eye, I'm very very good looking. It's only when I look in the mirror, and, <laughs> and I come face. So the same problem I have for the audience is this is the same problem I have for me. Like in my head, I think, wow, you you really should be you should be magnificent looking. And I know I'm not right. I'm I'm realistic, but I should be. And then. I think the same of people who are listening. So I'm like, oh, they must be so good looking. And and when I see them, I'm like, oh, okay. Normal well, normal people. Normal people. It's just, we're all, you talk about the spectrum. Most of us are somewhere in the middle. So there are people at the extremes who are like drop dead beautiful. And then there are people who are hideous. But most of us are somewhere in the middle. Yeah, I think... But for me, the fun part is always when the shallow guys, the ones who admit looks are everything, yeah. end up having to choose between two girls and they have no idea what they look like. And they choose the one that's less pretty. Oh, it's my best. Because then they, they get married, not married, they get engaged and then they meet up with these people who they, they lost out on. Oh, yeah. And you see their faces then. They're like, oh, I stuffed up. All right. Well, um, couple of things we have to get to this morning. There's quite a lot going on, and uh, we'll get to some news stories too. Uh, Leanne's got a couple of things she wants to tell us about the bizarre things she read about this weekend. And um, we can start off because we've got Dr. Hanan in a short while, so we'll have our mental health checkup for the morning. Um, mm -hmm. First things first, though, do I really need that couch? Facebook Marketplace is a playground for criminals, say crime experts, following the death of two brothers. This is absolutely terrifying. Okay, I read this story the other day and I thought, wow, you know, for some crap on Facebook Mar Fa Facebook Marketplace, and I remember LeBang used to use this all the time, two brothers 
were killed tragically in uh, Gebecha. I'm going to say PE. It's not, that's not, no one wants to call it that. No one. Um, two brothers killed in PE after responding to a Facebook marketplace ad for TV. Crime experts warn the platform is now unsafe, emphasizing the risks of online transactions. Mm. So we've, we've heard about people being ripped off, right? Where they advertise yeah. X, but it turns out to be Y, or it's not as good as they think it is. And, you know, there's such, such like, nonsense online that already you're, you're worried about being catfished you're worried about someone lying about the product making stuff up so you you've got to think about those things but now the big problem is you could actually be killed yeah i mean yeah like besides the money scams and um paypaling and yeah. you know transferring of money and then it didn't go through and sending through false um, proof of payments yeah, yeah, yeah. and it's a safety issue so when I moved um, two years ago I sold quite a few things on Facebook Marketplace and Gumtree Yes. so I used both but both times I was really really careful if anything sounded suspicious I made the meeting point at the Rosebank police station and as soon as you do that they're gone oh, I'm away. Okay. Yeah. Well, that's, so that's you've got to be careful thing. about meeting giving people your home address you know, rather mm. meet maybe at a petrol station, although I hear those are hotspots for crime now as well. <laughs> yeah. Just meet at a police station, perhaps. Yeah. Uh, Patrick says, everybody here calls it Port Elizabeth, and all the signboards say Port Elizabeth. I've never heard that other name on the ground here. Exactly. Mm. But there yeah, we go. It didn't really take off, hey? <laughs> so, so Indy says, and this is an interesting point, I know the story you're referring to. However, who the hell goes to Motherwell to buy a TV? It's a very dangerous area. They could offer me a car for free and I wouldn't go there. Well, mm. you know, if you if you go with your brother <clears throat> and you're you're two like healthy, you know, like strong guys, you think you think you're uh indefatigable. You think no one's gonna be able to take us down. And then they got there and, and they were murdered. And, the, and there was no TV. It was all bullshit. Uh, Mike Ballhase is of course the private investigator who's been on TV mm. a lot. He said people should avoid Facebook Marketplace due to all the dangers, stressing the importance of thorough research before transactions. Risks include robbery, violence, scams. Reaction Unit South Africa deals with such cases regularly, cautioning against falling for unrealistically low prices. To enhance safety, meet in secure locations, as Leanne said. She's, she's good at this. Seek opinions before transactions and avoid sharing personal information. Mm. Yeah, it's rough out there, man. And it's so true. You think, I often think, oh, I'll take my brother with me and I'll be fine. <laughs> it's mm. not going to help when, you, when you're dealing with murderers. No. Oh, my God, no. No, no, no. Mm -hmm. Then you're putting your brother in the firing line too. It's not just you, you know? Yeah. Yeah, so, I, I, think, I think I'm over that now that it's just, uh, there has to be some other safe way of doing things. Someone will come up with something, right? Well, I mean, people are so desperate to get a good deal that they'll do stupid stuff they'll put themselves in a very dangerous position and you know there's nothing you can do once you're in that position and you're and you're vulnerable like that it's like ooh, ooh, this is too late um i'm trying to think where it was that i suddenly thought okay this is a while ago i went somewhere i met somebody or i did some i did something and it was like a, a transactional thing and i was suddenly like jesus this is dumb of you you're like you're you're it was it was something to do with I was selling some I can't remember, but this is like about two years ago or something. You know when you're in this situation and you realize, oh my God, what am I doing here? This is crazy. Yeah. You get into I, it easily. I, out of it. I was I was like, no, 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 this is not gonna happen. So I just called and canceled. Yeah, it happened to a colleague of mine last week. Um on Friday, I believe. Yeah. He uh, he went to have his car serviced at a BMW dealership because he wanted to sell it. He had an, a, a guy who was interested in his car and he was interested in his. So it was going to be a, a swap basically with right. a bit of a cash handover or whatever. Yeah. Um, so he went to have it serviced as he was agreed to. And the guy doing the service said to him, are you selling this car? How much are you selling it for? And I want to buy it. Yeah. He then made an arrangement to meet him later on that day to test drive it and do what he wanted to do. And the guy never pitched. 
So, I mean, at that point, I would have already known. Firstly, he's the guy servicing my car. Do you think he's going to be able to afford a BMW? No, probably not. So, the, so the, this colleague of mine then went back to the dealership and said, there was a guy working on my car here. Do you know where he is? The manager came out and said, I'm sorry, I employed that guy three weeks ago. He definitely does not have the money to buy your car. Sure. Uh, wow. So you've just got to, yeah, you've got to be savvy about it, really. I remembered what it was. Um, it, it, oh, yeah. it, this, was this was a few years ago. And um, some guy like sent me an email and he's like, listen, we want to, uh, we want to sell you a car. I wasn't selling it. Someone else is selling it. But, you, but why don't you come through to the dealership and check it out? And I was like, okay, cool. But it was like late on a Saturday or a Sunday. And I suddenly thought, no, this doesn't feel mm -hmm. right. And I was on my way there and I canceled. That was the closest I've ever got to like utterly stupid things. You know, it was, a girl, it was a girl this weekend um, who she took her. Oh, she's the Americans say Mazda. Have you heard? Mazda. Yeah. yeah. I, I'm going to drive my Mazda. Yeah, I mean, the, oh. the, the, the go-to would be for them to say Mazda, but they say yeah. Mazda. Correct. Anyway, yeah. she, she has a new Mazda, and yeah. uh, it had a crack in the windshield that she, Mazda said they would repair for her. Um, and there was something else, like the, her, her blind spot tracker wasn't working, um, wasn't alerting her to people being in her blind spot. So they said, no, 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 bring it in, we'll fix it. She took it to the dealership. She then had recently downloaded the Mazda app and she was in bed at like 9.30 at night and realized that her car was not at the dealership. The doors had been unlocked. She got that notification. Then she tracked it and it was 120 miles away from the dealership. Oh, my God. At a private residence, like in a, in a suburb. Oh, uh, no parked in someone's driveway. So she thought, oh my gosh, it's been stolen from the dealership. So she then, she was going to call the police, but thought, let me just keep checking it. Maybe it's someone from the dealership. Uh, set her alarm for every hour and checked the location. And at 6.30 in the morning, it was back at the dealership. So she went and spoke to them and said, um, did somebody drive my car to their house last night? And they said, yes, no, we do that sometimes. She says, but 120 miles away to test for a crack in the windshield, a tiny crack, and a sensor on the bumper. And they were like, oh, yeah, no, but we also were trying to get the um, engine light to come on. She, and she called bullshit. And they gaslighted her completely. So, wow. yeah, we, we don't know what happens to our cars. And a quarter tank of petrol was missing from her car as well. Yeah, so they they basically driven it away for they'd used it. Yeah, sons of bitches. And All the right, other well, thing is, the person who owns the dealership does allow the guys to take the cars home and test them, but he doesn't want them to do it on his time. So that's yeah, why he lets yeah. them do it after work. Well, if it's not on the floor of the dealership, it's not going to sell, is it? No one wants to buy a car they can't see. It's amazing. Like we talk about Facebook Marketplace and all this stuff, right? And Tracy says here, community buy, sell and swap WhatsApp groups, get a lot of annoying messages. But for example, yesterday I sold my boys old hockey sticks. EFTs are done, boys are delivering the sticks at school. So we've got, uh, who hasn't, a neighborhood WhatsApp group, right? Mm. And people will sell all kinds of shit on there. They're like, I've got this freezer. Anybody want it? And then they'll put the price and you know, people will go on and buy it. But... I, s I suppose also you, you, it's all about the trust that you have in that particular app or those people. And in smaller groups, the smaller it is, the better. That's the way to do it. Mm. Isn't it yeah. great, though, that we can, we can sell things? I mean, when it's not a bullshit scam. It's great, though, we can sell these things on these groups. You don't even have to leave your house. You don't have to put it out in the street with a sign on it saying 50 Rand or whatever. Because that's what mm. they used to. Yeah, that's what we did. We were just, or you know, you'd you'd have to get a table and chair and sit there and wait all day until someone walked past. Right. I mean, Mig says, Tracy, I'm part of eight WhatsApp buyers and sellers groups. Sure. Well, it's just a matter Good. of time until the criminal element gets in there too. Ah, spot on. 
All right, where is James? We need to do a little update on the uh, on the sport over the weekend with Super Bets. We'll check on what went on and what happened there, and he'll give he us a little. Right We're going to talk to uh, Markham Dluley later on. He's going to tell us about the Comics Choice Awards, which happened this past Saturday. He was there, and he knows all the gossip. And uh, also talking about con artists, someone tried to take him for a ride and succeeded. So we'll oh. find out about yeah his stupid thing that happened. So that's all coming up. Don't go anywhere. That's going to be lots of fun. Plus, Leanne has the list of the countries with the worst food. And I'll bet you any amount of money Britain is on there. Well, we'll just have to see. Yeah, Britain is definitely on the list. James, what are you doing? Are you stumbling over Leanne's chair and tripping and falling? Yeah, there's a little bit of a cord incident. Jesus. <laughs> just a charger. That guy, that guy was – he was he – was, uh, Running around the studio this morning like a blue-assed fly trying to figure out how the desk worked. That's why we started late. I'm like, oh, my God. I've hired the, I've hired the worst person in the world. <laughs> oh, come on, Garrett. That's tough. That's tough. Your mic's Again, not on. Your, your mic's not on. And now you, you're nowhere near the desk. It's just a horrible time. Time <laughs> why did you use mine? No, 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 no. Let him get his microphone working. My God. You know? We've uh, we've been doing this what ten years. We still don't know what we're doing. It's ridiculous. And by the way, a little later also, this is going to be lots of fun. Uh, South African booties have been rated the biggest. Yeah, that's fine. Now we can hear you. So if you think you have a big booty this morning, if you think your backside is too big, don't feel bad because apparently that's what we've got in South Africa. It's one of our one of our unique selling points, as they would say in the business world, our USPs. All right, <laughs> let's get into some sport. Take a look at what's going on. James is ready. He's got a little breakdown of what we may have missed over the weekend. And I saw there was plenty of golf, as Ben spoke about. In fact, it was on in the background. That Masters course looked terrific. I don't know who won, though. So don't ask me. I'm the worst guy to ask about sports results. James is uh, only marginally better, but here he is. I can answer that question of who won uh, the Masters. It was Scotty Scheffler who won his yes. second Masters. Um, good. Pretty incredible for him. 11 under par winning the right. tournament in the end. Um, and a bunch else happened on the sporting front this weekend. Before we get into it, let's uh, just stick with the golf. Ludwig Aberg came in second at seven under par. Um, cool. And then noteworthy performances from Max Homer, Tommy Fleetwood, and Colin Marikawa um, all there on the leaderboard. All of the top 12 and tied placement um, athletes all got invited to next year's Masters tournament, which is all obviously great for them. Uh, moving on to the rugby. Sure, what a weekend in the world of rugby. Um, action packed quarterfinals as eight teams were reduced to four with Bordeaux Beagles, La Rochelle, the Bulls and the Exeter Chiefs all falling to defeats. So the results there, Bordeaux Beagles lost 41-42 to the Harlequins, Leinster against La Rochelle. Uh, Leinster won their 40-13. Um, Northampton mm -hmm. Bulls 59-22 um, and Toulouse took on Exeter Toulouse winning that 64-26 that sets up a semi-final for the Investec Champions Cup Leinster Northampton on the 4th of May Toulouse and the Harlequins also um, on the 6th of May so as that's that tournament cool. winds down to a close uh, another tournament kind of that's winding down to a close and calling, causing me mass stress in my life constantly on a daily basis uh, would be the Premier League. Uh, Liverpool played again this weekend. We didn't do what we needed to do two weekends in a row. Um, and this is how it kind of played out. So City had played their first game on Saturday, um, sending them to the top of the log. Uh, good for City fans, wherever they are. Um, they were on top of the log by two points after their game on Saturday. Liverpool and Arsenal had to play their games on Sunday. Um, so it was all on them. And they ended up dropping the ball. Uh, the last one, North Crystal Palace. Um, but we still had a little bit of hope um, in Arsenal and them losing to Aston Villa, which they ended up doing 2-0. Um, the log currently, as it stands, Man City at the top, 73 points. Arsenal in at second with 71. And then Liverpool in also at 71. With about six, seven games or so to go, um, it winds down and uh, Liverpool could miss out on that Premier League trophy that I was so confident about last week. Um, sticking with the Premier League, just a little bit of a run-in for the last couple of games for those teams at the top. City do have 
statistically the easiest run in um, for those last couple of games. So it's theirs to lose, is essentially what I'm saying. Um, and history hasn't been great to Liverpool uh, in that sense. So we'll see how it goes. Six, seven or so games to go. Um, James, James, when you when you say when you say you're stressing about this, I I, I don't. You know, I've never been a massive sports fan. I mean, I, I kind of know what's going on, but only just. Are you telling me that you seriously like sit there nail biting? You're you're nervous. You you worry about your team. Yeah. You, yeah. you 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 don't want to yeah. eat because you're like, oh my god, what if they don't win? Is, is that for real? You actually get stressed. All of the above, yes. Um, these, when it gets to this point of the, the the season, it genuinely can have the power to make or break your week and your weekend. What are you retarded? Jesus. <laughs> 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 uh, <laughs> um, for supporting Liverpool, sometimes I feel it. I'm not going to lie to you, uh, but it does feel that way. Uh, but, but yes, I have been told that uh, there, there are bigger problems in the world than than football. Uh, yeah. and I you almost, everybody's talking about being on the brink of World War Three with Iran and Israel and all of this stuff, and you're worried about like, oh, they didn't get that goal. Oh, what are we going to do? <laughs> I, I, it's a thing. It's a thing. <laughs> I saw World War Three training on Twitter this past weekend, and I scrolled immediately past it and into what was training for the football. So, if that answers yeah. your question, yeah, that's that's pretty well, much my I life. Mean, life. J- JP says it affects your mood, Gareth. Try to be a United supporter. Uh, sure. Traveling Ninja Turtle says, "Why do people care so much about teams?" Uh, but but I'm I'm kind of I can see it really affects people. Patrick says Liverpool messed it up, not over, but it's their fault. Yeah. See, yeah. these are all true comments, especially the United yeah. supporter one. Um, I mean, you thought I was stressed. You should see how stressed United fans get. It's um, it's quite a scene. <laughs> A very um, low, very low IQ uh, team and very low IQ supporters. They're very. Sure. I mean, I'm not going to argue with that point at all. <laughs> what do um, I know? I don't know anything about uh, soccer. So carry on. Uh, Sticking with the football Medbank quarter finals, uh, Sundowns, Chipper, Pirates, and Stellenbosch all through to the semis, um, with Sundowns squeaking through on penalties. Quite a surprise there, with Sundowns being the team that they generally are and. Uh, Almost taking Bafana to an Afghan win, uh, which is something I will never forget in my entire life. Um, yeah. And then lastly, with the UFC, wow. Wow, 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 wow. People are calling it the knockout of the century. Um, oh, a knockout wow. for the ages, even. If it's a video you haven't seen, I'd love to play it on the show, but um, copyright things and stuff. Uh, Max Holloway took on uh, Justin Gaethje, and he absolutely... Round five's knockout was... If you haven't seen it, go check it out. Um, it's all over Twitter. Well, and I mean, look, look I, don't, I don't follow a ton of UFC stuff, but it was mm. coming up on my feed like you cannot believe on Saturday and Sunday. Uh, well, Sunday, I think, not Saturday. One of the two. Anyway, it was coming up nonstop. All the reaction... Uh, all the all the guys in the crowd, the, uh, mm. the that kind of a must be famous now a picture of the of the dude knocked out lying on the floor, and the other guy kind of standing up celebrating. But, Very impressive. I've never in my life, uh, as as you're talking about it now, I actually had goosebumps. It was honestly one of the craziest knockouts I've ever seen. Um, Drikus was also there representing South Africa. Uh, Drikus was in South Africans proud. Um, him and Israel Adesanya, who potentially may or may not have a fight coming up in the near future. There was a lot of tension. The cameras cut in between them. It was a whole Hollywood situation. Yeah, there you go. Ricky Lodricus was there in um, the crowd. But yeah, I think sporting-wise, that was about it. Quite a good sporting weekend, especially if you're a golf fan or a Man City fan. Um, Yeah, I I think a lot happened this weekend. Uh, Kept people quite busy. Well, that's very good. And that's plenty of stuff for you to have uh, placed bets on and won potentially you could have won quite a lot of money and of course if you do there's plenty of uh, of tips and tricks that you can learn about by going to the super bets website you can also place small bets or big ones it's totally up to you makes a hell of a lot more exciting i can tell you that super bets of course also supports responsible gambling so no under 18s winners know when to stop the south african responsible gambling toll-free counseling hotline is 0800 006 008 thank you james thank you Very guys good. There we and go. Yes, I, see, I see from Nikita there uh, in mm. more sports news. Gerda Stein broke her own two oceans ultra record marathon this weekend. I saw the clip of her in the last couple of meters. Yeah, <laughs> she was just beaming. While she, I mean, who can do that after a marathon? 
but she was beaming while she was running the last few meters. Listen, I know I've got friends who ran in that thing and they love yeah. it. Yeah. They love it. They beam, they're beaming because they actually just love it. Um, apparently the wind is still blowing down there like a motherfucker though. I mean, Cape Town is really, it's just, it's been insane, right? My, um, my brother and, and his family are down there at the moment and I don't know how much fun they're having because the wind is blowing so much, but mm -hmm. I don't know. You go to Cape Town in April, you kind of deserve it. That's <laughs> what's going to happen. Um, Izzy looked very salty, Mr. Manifestation. Dana White announced McGregor versus Chandler for June. That's all to do with UFC. Mm. Um, Rebellious Ruth says, my cousin did it. I assume that's the, uh, the, the two oceans. Also did extremely well. So happy. Well done, Ian. Nice. You know what? Um, respect to those people. Respect to them because I would not run. Only the evil man runneth when nothing is chasing him. I got to read you the facts of a story before we get to Dr. Hanan. This is going to blow your mind. So a friend of mine is a, a lawyer. He sent this to me. I don't know how much this happens in South Africa, but it is quite scary. So this is, uh, I'm just going to give you the facts of the case. I'm not going to mention any names or anything. Facts. All right. Are you ready, Leanne? Yeah. The accused went and stayed with his brother and sister in a shack. Sorry, his brother and sister-in-law in a shack in their yard. Upon arrival, he discovered that another brother, S, who had grown up with him, was very ill. S suffered from a severe bloated stomach and required periodic hospitalization. The condition worsened despite medical treatment. The accused felt helpless and upset, having offered whatever assistance was possible, including financial support, towards treatment and transport. The accused came to believe that his aunt, the deceased, was responsible for S's condition in that she had bewitched him, Ooh. blaming her for his condition. He then decided to kill the deceased because of what she had done. He assaulted the deceased using a panga-like object to cause her death, striking her several times in the head area. Jeez. As reflected, as reflected in the post-mortem examination, the cause of death was traumatic head injury. Now, what's interesting here is, obviously, this, this was witchcraft, right? According to this dude, the reason that he had to kill this woman was mm. because she, she was a witch. Yeah. So, I mean, for, for those of us who don't believe in witches and witchcraft and casting spells, um, the you know, I would think that maybe another way she could have been re responsible was if she was slowly poisoning him over time. That's more realistic and believable from a scientific um, standpoint. But, but witchcraft. No, no, no. So so she's gone and he's in jail. Of course, the bad news is that he still gets a vote in the elections. This, this guy who believes in witchcraft and who, who killed somebody with a panga-like object to the head. This guy still has a vote in our upcoming election. Isn't that great? Mm, it's happening all around us. Wow. It just blows my mind. And then I found this very important line from the King James version of the Bible. You know how I'm a biblical scholar, right? Yes, and because you you have one next to your bed, which you read. Of course. And it says here, thou shalt not suffer a witch to live. Exodus twenty two eighteen. Thou shalt not suffer a witch to live. That would be my defense. I would say, listen. The Bible, the Bible told me so. <laughs> You know, like you, you know, get a lot of Christians who say, Jesus loves me. Yes, I know. For the Bible tells me so. Mm. So I, could go, I killed a witch. Yes, you know, because the Bible told me so. So I, I feel like that's a foolproof way of, um, of exonerating yourself. I started watching a documentary. It's, um, I think it's called Unlocked. Ooh. It's new on Netflix. And it's about this one specific unit at Rikers. Uh, Rikers Jail, Rikers Prison, um, mm -hmm. this division where it's mainly people who are, they've just been arrested or they're awaiting trial or they're between court cases. But we're yeah. talking murderers, drug uh, possession, drug trafficking, rape. They're, they're hardcore. They're part of gangs. Lovely people. Yeah. And uh, this this sheriff who has is has newly taken over the position of like the the head honcho of this division 
has been studying for years the way prisons work in Europe. Um, that's some of the, the, the material that he's looked at. And mm -hmm. he's all about rehabilitation rather than punishment. So what's happening at this unit of Rikers is because it's so overcrowded, they are in their cells locked up with their cellmate for 23 hours a day. Jeez. They get one, one hour out. And that one hour is broken up into... 15 minutes here and there to eat. So it's not a full hour in, at once, right? Wow. And these these men are going crazy behind these bars in the small room for 23 hours a day. And what happens is by the time they're let out and the doors are opened bit by bit to let them eat, they're so wound up. They've had no exercise. They've had no fresh air. They're going nuts. And they just start beating up each other. Um, and, you know, letting out all of their frustrations. So this sheriff has come along and said, I want to change this. So he's started, the, this is real, it ha it's happened. He started yeah. this experiment where he said, he brought them all out. He said, guys, I don't like what's happening here. I want to give you more freedom. I want you guys to show me that you can, you know, live in a society-like situation again. I want mm -hmm. you to prove it to me. I'm opening all the doors. 24-7, all the prison doors. Oh, wow. And I'm taking away the guards. You need to organize your own feeding times, tray, food, dishing up, cleaning up, all of that type of stuff. Y you make the rules. Oof. And immediately, all of the older generation prisoners there, so the gray-haired guys, yeah. get together and they're like, we've got to watch this. We, we're going to see this motherfucking place burn down if we don't take some control. Right. Um, and they have this plan and they go around to all the cell doors the night before and they say, I want you to be responsible for this. You to be responsible for that. The young ones, immediately as the doors are opened, there's this division now between young and old. So already mm -hmm. where they're supposed to be working together, there's already a division. And the young ones don't want to listen to the older ones. We're not listening to these old folk, blah, blah, blah. So I'm on yeah. episode two right now. They're two hours into the first 24 hours of unlocked doors. And nothing violent has happened yet, but, man, they're out of control. <laughs> they're, they're all smoking oh. like weird shit, like these, um, you, you get these toilet paper Think the twists that they dip in coffee and they smoke them, and they're all losing their minds because of this. It's rough, man. It's so rough. Well, I I would do that. I don't care about like hardcore prisoners. I, I would just open up the doors and let them kill each other. I'd be like, all right, whoever the biggest, ugliest one that kills all the others is, and we'll take him out with a bolt to the head or something. But I I this makes me extremely nervous. I I just don't like the, the the fringes of society where this kind of shit happens. And there's some dangerous people there, no doubt, right? Hugely. These people have spent most of their lives in and out of jail. They don't know much different. Let us turn our attention to Dr. Hanan. It is time for what we do with him on a Monday, which is called It's Going to Be Okay. And uh, he's, of course, a renowned psychologist, head of the Anxiety and Trauma Clinic in Johannesburg. And he's here for us every Monday. Hey, Doc. Hey guys, how you doing? Very hey. good. Very good. Hey, hey. So, Doc, um, let's just look at this quickly. We're going to delve into some celebrity drama. Uh, Jennifer Lopez. Apparently, she's had weak tour sales, a baffling album, movie documentary, and general online mockery. Why does everyone seem to hate Jennifer Lopez so much? What is our obsession with celebrities? Why, why do we watch these things like an accident happening in front of us? And why do we expect more from celebrities than we do from normal people? Well, society puts these celebrities or these, um, these uh, people that we see on a daily basis on a, on a pedestal, on a hierarchy, on a social hierarchy. We view them as higher than you know, us and uh, something that we should aspire to and look up to because they've gone so much attention and so much admiration. So it's um, the whole numbers thing. How many people follow you on Twitter? How many people follow you on Facebook? How many people follow you on any social media? Those are the people that you want to be around. We want to be around people that are, you know, surrounded by bodyguards at a club or people that are surrounded by hordes of fans at a concert. We want to be surround. We want to be around people that, as I said, garner attention and admiration. 
And we look at these people and we see them as almost godlike and we expect them to behave. But there's a, a side to us that wants to see them fail as well, because then it makes them human too. It is a, almost like an internal gratification when we see someone that we see as absolute godlike make a mistake, falter, shave their hair, get a divorce, you know, <laughs> scream in the middle of a, of a, I don't know, of a shopping mall or scream at their kids because it makes them human, which makes us feel better about ourselves. Hmm. I think, I don't know if Gareth's gone off to shave his head <laughs> or get divorced. Oh, we can't hear him. My mic was muted. Sorry. Oh, there I was we talking, go. I was talking, <laughs> talking to myself. No, you know, we, we do. We put these people on a pedestal and we expect them to behave better than us. And they don't. And, and then we're somehow disappointed. That's an us problem, though. That's not a them problem. That's an us problem, for sure. For sure. Like, first of all, the fact that Jennifer... Lopez, you know, has weak cells or strong cells, or whether she's having a fight with her husband or not. Uh, that's that's not your lane. I always tell people that you know, focus on investing your coins, your energy into things that make your life better. How does right. knowing that uh, Jennifer has good cells, bad cells? How does it make your life better? How does it make you a better father, a better husband, a better wife, a better mother? How does it make you a better worker? How does it make yeah. and increase your sense of purpose in life? So invest your time and energy into things that create value. But to your point, yes, it's completely a nice problem. You know, when I see these celebrities doing, I don't know, crazy things, crazy things, it's crazy by their standards. It's normal human stuff. And the truth is, us human, us mortal humans, we also do crazy things, but it's not caught on camera and not being portrayed on social media. So uh, when I see these celebrities doing these things, I'm always like, well, obvious, because they're human beings. Okay, but then I've got to ask you another question. Um, why do we get so involved? Um, because you, you say quite rightly, we've got to stay in our lane. It's got nothing to do with us. It's not going to affect our lives in any way. So why is it that ordinary people take such an interest in these uh, celebrities to the point where they allow themselves to be distracted from their own shortcomings, responsibilities? The stuff that we have to do. We, some people I know are more interested in celebrities than they are in their own children. Definitely. Definitely. That's quite right. <laughs> that hell? is quite right. But Gareth, you know, the it's a very primitive psychological thing to draw your attention towards the most popular you know, guy or girl in the room. If you walk into a club and you know it, somebody whispers in your ear, there's Beyonce, you are suddenly going to leave your friends you suddenly don't care about, you know, the person that you were talking to and your attention is going to go towards the, you know, Beyonce because she's the most popular girl in the room or whoever you admire, whatever, whoever your, your mentor is or whoever you look up to, whoever is the highest on the social hierarchy scale for you. So mm -hmm. we as human beings, and by the way, why do we do that? Because it ensures our survival. When we attach ourselves to people of higher hierarchy, of high importance, we are more likely to survive and feel protected. When we attach ourselves to people of lower social uh, control, social hierarchy, we are not going to be protected by them because they don't possess the same power, the same leverage, the same weaponry, the same defense systems as the people that have much more power, much more money, much more influence. And that's why we are naturally we naturally gravitate our attention towards those. Yeah, well, th those people aren't going to protect and give you power. That's the whole problem, though. They don't even know you exist. Complete. <laughs> A hundred percent, a hundred percent. But that's where social media kind of like stuffed it all up because the you're quite right. While we think that if we just gravitate and get the likes from these individuals, we are going to be much more popular. We're going to kind of move up the ranks on the social hierarchy. But social media completely messes it up because we get these likes and we get these thumbs up and we get these loves and we get these, uh, you know, whatever we get. And we think it's real. We think that means yeah. we're moving up. The social hierarchy, meanwhile, it's all Amazing. gibberish. It's all nonsense stuff. So, all right, one last thing here. You, some of these people are actually terrible examples of how to behave. I mean, J-Lo, for example, really doesn't know how to behave. She's She's got a bit of an attitude about herself. She's uh, She doesn't seem very likable. She surrounds herself with uh, sycophants and people who tell her how great she is all day, day in and day out. She doesn't seem to have any checks and balances on her own bad behavior. And I'm not going at Jennifer Lopez. She just happens to have been in the news last week. And there's this 
huge outpouring of real dislike for her. But despite that, she still seems to think everybody loves her. So if you are famous and you are important, in inverted commas, in the world, how do you maintain a, a, a grounded approach? How do you, if you are someone who, let's say you're the, the, you're the boss in your company or you're the most popular kid at school or whatever else, how do you make sure that you don't get to a point where you become such a pain in the ass that everyone hates you? Yeah, that's a really good question. And um, I'll introduce you to a concept that I use in my world and I teach my patients on a daily basis. I'll build some context. My brother's a pilot and my brother shared this with me. Pilots never trust their feelings when they fly. And the reason why they don't trust their feelings is because feelings lie to us all day long. Feelings are lies. We've discussed this many, many times. Feelings are pathological lies. And when in midair, at that kind of altitude, when your body's telling you gravitating right, you could in reality be gravitating left. And when your body's telling you you're steady, you could be actually nose diving straight to the ground. So I asked my brother, what do pilots then trust? And he says, pilots trust their instruments because mm -hmm. instruments never lie. And the number one mistake, and we make two of them, the number one mistake that we make is we trust our feelings. We've discussed this many, many times on the show because if you trust your feelings, you will naturally gaslight yourself because your feelings will lie to you. And the number two mistake that we make is we trust broken instruments. If you trust broken instruments, you will be gaslit too. So imagine this scenario. Imagine I have a fight with my wife and I lean on my best friend for advice, but this best friend has been divorced six times, cheated on every single one of his partners, and he's loving single life. He's naturally going to gaslight me. So mm -hmm. it doesn't make him a bad person. It just makes him the wrong instrument for this kind of job. So I'm not going to go for a run now and lean on my thermometer to tell me how fast I'm running. The thermometer is not broken, but it is the wrong instrument. Mm -hmm. So when you ask me, how did these uh, celebrities, and that goes for everybody from you know the normal us to these celebrities, is we all need to be calibrated, but choose your instruments wisely. If you surround yourself with people that always tell you you are right, you are good, you are wonderful, you're amazing, you are naturally going to crash. Because yeah. imagine flying a plane that always tells you you're flying great. You know, it's like the emperor's new clothes. <laughs> you know, if everybody's telling you that you always are great, you will end up crashing. So the best way to calibrate yourself is ask yourself, am I surrounded with the correct calibrated instruments? Am I surrounded with people who are honest with me and who will tell me the truth? Because those are the people that are going to calibrate you. Whether you're a celebrity or it doesn't matter, whether you're mortal us. Surround yourself with people who are honest, who are naturally going to give you the reliable and valid advice that you need. Sure. Uh, it's hard to find those people and it's hard yeah. to keep going like that because once you decide that you're friends and you really love each other and you start saying nice things about each other and you mean it, uh, eventually you do shy away from giving people the honest feedback that they need. And sometimes that feedback is going to hurt. Sometimes it can impact very badly on the friendship. But those are the real friends that you actually need. Definitely. Definitely. And I'm not saying have, you know, f friendships can be different things for different people. So I have my tennis friend and I've got my let's go out and talk rubbish friend. And I just want my tennis friend to be honest with me with tennis. And I want my mm. let's go, uh, go out friend and talk business to be honest with me with that. So I don't need, you know, one friend for everything. But I need in those departments and those environments, I always choose to have honest friends compared to nice friends. I remember my feelings are irrelevant. I just want to be guided by the correct instruments. If I'm in the forest and I want to, and I need to get out, I don't care about the nice map. I want an accurate map. I don't care about the nice compass. I want an accurate compass, irrespective of what I feel, because I would rather have an honest person that leads me out of my troubles, that leads me out of the forest, than have a nice friend that keeps me stuck in gaslit. Yeah. Hard to find. Got to, yeah, you got sure. to hope you, you got to hope you've got those people in your life, and you 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 better hope that they are honest with you, um, because you can also it can take you a long time to figure out who your real friends are. Definitely, definitely. Mm -hmm. But there there is a way to figure it out, and uh, you always are. You need to be guided by the results. If you feel that you are getting the results, that means you're being guided accurately. And if you're not getting to from point A to point B then you're being misguided. So ask yourself, and we go back to many, many shows ago when I said, you know, the, the, the goal becomes the God. What do you want out of life? 
and ask yourself whether you have the right people to get you to the goal. And if you're getting to the goal, then you're surrounded by the right instruments. And if you're not getting to the goal, then you need to maybe reassess. Instruments, yeah. Change those instruments. Carl DeSantos says, I know why you don't rely on your tennis friend for advice. It's always back and forth with him. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, Thank you, Doc. Good to see no, you. Okay, guys. Nice to see you. Good week. See Cheers. You. Dr. Dr. Uh, Dr. Very good. All right. Ass, are we ready for our uh, next hour? Are you are you pumped? Are you ready to go? Yeah, ready to go. I'd, uh, yeah, I'd love like a, a chocolate smoothie or something right now. Do you think we can whip one up? Um. Yeah, sure. Go and look in the kitchen, see what you can find. <laughs> sure. Oh, while you're not here, I'll just raid your kitchen. Raid, raid the cupboard. <laughs> Um, just quickly, Deirdre, so this is funny. Deirdre says, my mom knows more about Caroline and Bobby von Jarsfeld than she knows about me or cares. I just can't take it personally. Okay. <laughs> well, there we go. Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Beautiful. Okay. We'll be back in a second. Don't go anywhere. Cliffcentral.com. It is a Monday morning and we have loads of good stuff still to come. Where's this ad break? There it is. Right, all right, all right. It is Monday morning, and this is the Real Network, and we are joined by Mark Mdluli along with Leanne Mole this morning. Hey, Mark, how the hell are you, dude? I haven't seen you in a while. I'm good. Well, how are you guys? Yeah, I'm good. I'm good. Highly blessed and highly favored. <laughs> Excellent. Excellent. I like the hair. You've done something there. 
Yeah, no, it's dreadlocks. So the way this started was actually with lockdown. So after lockdown, you know, you couldn't go to the barber for a long time. So my hair just grew and grew and grew and then started to look good. I'm like, ah, you know what, I'm going to keep this. And people give, they call me Rasta in the streets now. So <laughs> I've got some extra street cred just because of it. I'm like, yeah. yeah. So is, that, like uh, is, that, is that getting you laid? Uh, let's talk about this after the show, guys. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because, yeah, maybe it is. Maybe it is. I don't want to break too many hearts out there. <laughs> uh, no. If I were you, I'd be, I'd be advertising this. This is a very good move. <laughs> okay, so uh, we've got quite a lot to get through this morning, and there's some things on your agenda. I know you went to the uh, Comics Choice Awards. Tell me how that was. Oh, it was absolutely fantastic. The Comics Choice Awards is probably my favorite night of the year every year. I call it Comedian's Christmas. <laughs> it's such so a good who, time because who were all there and 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 what happens and you know the rest of us have never been to one of these things so you're the only one who knows give us the insight all right cool so it actually starts way before the night um probably one of the biggest events leading up to it is the newcomers showcase where there's about 20 newcomers in the industry um that are chosen to perform this year it was at the nelson mandela theater on the square and yeah, they all give us five minutes of their best material. And we kind of guess based on that, who's going to be the newcomer. But obviously all the stuff that they've done in the industry as well counts. Uh, wow. But it's the only place where you'll see people like from Cape Town, if you're from Joburg, for instance. Who votes? I mean, like, how do they decide who this newcomer is, by the way? Is it is it all you other comics that get together? It's like the Academy. You all yes. have a vote. Is that yes. how it works? It's it's, yeah, so it's called the Comics Choice Awards. So the comics vote, uh, you rate each comic uh, from five, one to five. One to five, your best comic, you give them five points. Your least favorite com uh, comic, you give them one point. And then that obviously matters to a total number. The person with the most number wins, least, we don't even So I'm really pleased they only go from one to five because a lot of comics I know can't, can't be on five. So that's very <laughs> cool. Yeah, that's already too much math for us, if I'm being honest. The whole system on the computer, I was like, this is too much. Somebody else voted for me. But uh, it's really cool because I think it's very honest in terms of the direct result. Um, obviously, every industry has its politics. But yeah, I really think it's a valuable exercise for comedy. After the newcomers showcase, there's a few other showcases from previous winners for example and then yeah last night was the big one or saturday night rather was the big one and paul pops was the host and right. yeah, he was a fantastic host i won't even lie it was incredible everybody looked incredible and it's just a, it's a, the only day where we all come together as comedians to celebrate the industry because most of the time you're alone as a comedian it's actually quite a lonely journey mm -hmm. Um, yeah. But on that day, we come together and we're like, yo, this is actually what we all struggle for. It's the first time you, you get to feel like a celebrity as a, as a comedian for once. I love that. I think that's very cool. And there is, I mean, like South Africa, obviously, is huge competition. You guys are all fighting for gigs and all the rest of it. But the reality is, like a lot of you really get along. And yeah. and also when you're around people who uh, whose job it is to make you laugh, yeah, there tend to be a lot of very funny things that get said and, and funny things that get done. It's It's a nice vibe. Yeah, exactly. And everybody on the stage was amazing. So one of the cool things I like about this award ceremony is that if you win an award, you have to do a speech in comic form. So you'll do five minutes of comedy after you've accepted your award. And you really, you really have to prove live in real time that you're funny to us. You know, there's right. no, there's no hiding, which uh, makes it honest mm. which makes it honest because we can all see and if you bomb a sh like ah, that one was a mistake <laughs> but yeah, yeah most comics in south africa as you know are really brilliant so yeah it ended up being a really great time all the other acts on stage were also funny yeah it was just fantastic and the after party too though also you didn't win anything no 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 let's not go there either let's not go there either Me, uh, i'm low-key gareth i'm low-key you see but let's, here's one uh, of the things that i, I no, enjoy no, we, we, we don't want to we don't want to hear any more from you you didn't win <laughs> uh here's some here's some, the names of some of the winners so we got uh, fiso nene mark lottering uh Vafanaragi, uh who else did we have here fiso nene got the joma fella award yeah um, yeah i was very and, happy and the host, is this right that um, Pop Pops, the host, won Comedian of the Year? How can he, he win that and be the host? Isn't that, uh, that, that doesn't <laughs> seem right. To me. Well, people voted a long time ago. Uh, 
previously to him being chosen as the host even so it was just a coincidence and i think it was a great one i think he was the most well-deserved um comedian in that category so he's done so well this year so i really really was impressed but going back to uh having not won an award i think you got wrong mark because mark lottery won the hall of fame award this year and the interesting thing about that is that apparently he told me this himself he said for 20 years he applied to become a comedian uh, a comic choice awards winner at some point and he never won in all 20 years his first award was the hall of fame award on saturday so there's still hope for me there's still hope for me yeah. <laughs> i hope dude and you know what frankly who cares about these awards if you're yeah, getting the to be honest if you're doing the shows and people are enjoying you that's all that matters actually yeah that truly is the case and yeah it's just a party man we just we're just celebrating what we do all right very good so apparently Leanne has discovered that South Africa, we have the biggest booties in the world. Is that right, Ass? Is that, uh, is that a, tr a true statement? We absolutely smashed the competition to claim a victory for the biggest booties on the planet. Now next um, year you will be next year, Mark uh, will be hosting that awards show. For sure, for sure. I'm doing the ones in preparation. Yeah, you, you're not interested in hosting the Comics Choice Awards, but this you would be interested in hosting. Yes, yes, let's show me some booty. Let's see, let's see. We're gonna, we need to involve some twerking too as well. So, yeah, apparently it's it was very scientific. There were re uh, researchers who took part. Um, other top contenders were Argentina and Sweden, which I was quite surprised mm. about. Uh, but South Africa came out top with very impressive measurements. Um, and apparently everyone on social media was celebrating with with joy and glee. I know that in, in some cases it might be, and I was thinking about what your response would be, Gareth, but I know that you think of maybe like an obesity crisis and that sort of yes. angle. Yeah. But I think a lot of it, um, and I tried to see if they used like a waist to booty ratio or something like that, but it yeah. seems like they just measured booties. Um, so the average measurement for South Africa is 105.9 centimeters. Shout out to the Zulu woman. <laughs> yeah, you got that right. Um, and uh, apparently Argentina and Sweden came in close behind. They had 104.14 centimeters and 103.86. So it was quite close, 105, 104, 103. Right. Well, um, Look, I mean, we we don't have to talk about uh, obesity. If you were selling jeans in this country, though, yeah, you, what's, the point, what's the point in selling those uh, super skinny jeans? There are only like ten women who who could buy them and fit into them. You want to sell as many pairs of jeans as possible. So, do we have? Because this came up in conversation over the weekend. Do we have a different um, national kind of average measurement for things like jeans for women? If we win the biggest booty in the world. And you said we come first by a long way. Mm -hmm. Then obviously the sizes of outfits that we sell in our stores is very different to what they would sell in, I don't know, Japan. A hundred percent. And that's why there is um, such a big movement in South Africa to get in plus size clothing. But the problem is it's not about mm -hmm. being plus sized. It's about your body shape, right? So you might have this like skinny waist. Yes. But you, so now we've got our curvy jeans which are measured properly so that you don't end up having this extra bandwidth on the pan at the back of your uh, your waist in your jeans. So and and a lot of local designers are coming up with their own ways of um, you know creating patterns and clothing for women with a body shape like most South Africans. But uh, apparently everyone was very disappointed in Brazil. Because oh. they barely even made it onto the list of 15 countries. And yeah, because we talk about uh, big BBLs, right? Big Brazilian <laughs> butt or whatever. Exactly. Brazilian butt, butt lifts. I must say, I'm really proud of our country. I always knew we were the best country in the world. <laughs> and this really goes to prove it. We have Tyler, we have the box, we have the biggest booties. Guys, come to SA. <laughs> yeah, very, very impressed. I think, you know what, we'll take any win we can. And uh, this is one that we can be proud of. I like it. Yeah, it's a DNA thing. Uh, like some of the comments said, a lot of people pointed to Sarah Bartman saying, mm -hmm. we're Sarah Bartman's grandchildren. What were you expecting? <laughs> um, long live the spirit of Auntie Sarah Bartman. Long live. 
Um, mm. And then someone saying, no wonder uh, Nigerians are obsessed with South African women. Well, there we are. I mean, listen, let's take the win. As I said, we must be very proud of ourselves. We've uh, we've got something here that we've scored. We've we've done the best in the world. Uh, we're at the top. Another That's one, honest. another another medal. Beautiful. I didn't measure, That's but perfect. but I would have brought the average down. So <laughs> you would have brought it down. Oh yeah, no, I, I've got zero, but <laughs> yeah, I know. But by the way, does this count for guys as well? Because it's fine for us to assume that this is all just about the women. But do we have, do guys in this country have big butts as well? Yes. So, the closer men, the closer men are the yeah. ones who have booties. So there was another thing I tried to find out was if they said South African women, but mm -hmm. they just said South Africans. So look, I wasn't asked to get my booty measured. So <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, where did the they get these results? I actually want to know where they went to go do this research. <laughs> well, um, yeah, I mean, I've, I haven't bought a, a new pair of jeans for a little while, but as far as I can tell, they've got a length measurement and they've got a waist measurement. That's all you've got. Well, that's for men. Yeah, we are. For women. It's... How many measurements, how many different numbers are there for you? Um, so it's not so much about the numbers. It's about the style, the name of the style that you choose. And there are, oh, the, the list's growing all the time. I mean, oh. there might be. 20 to 40 different styles on one wall of jeans and sure. you'll know the one that that you're looking for that's good for you okay and and if you don't if you don't choose the right one you're just gonna walk out of there with either a, a really flat ass with your with the jeans falling down on them or it's not going to go over your ass right yeah one one of the above <laughs> so it's very interesting Brazil has shapely booty. We have blobs, says Mo Rabbit. That's not so nice. Uh, Afrikaans women are packing huge dump trucks, says Enon Chief Twat. Uh, do those measured include medically enlarged behinds, the Brazilian butt lifts? I don't know, Tracy. I'm, I'm not the expert in this field, but possibly. My Zulu nickname is Shwapasaiko. I don't know if I'm spelling that right. I'm slippery pickle. Men uh, lose their butts in their 40s, according to Max Sony. I, I've never had, I've always had the flattest backside imaginable. So, I mean, I just, I think I look pretty shitty in all jeans. It doesn't matter what kind. I, there's no style that really works for me. You must start sagging your pants, Gareth. That's the only way to get away with it. It's only yeah, way to be cool and have a flat butt at the same time. Start what right. them? Sagging his oh, pants. Sagging them. It's like, it's a style, yeah, yeah. not my ass. Yeah, yeah. Remember, <laughs> remember that, 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 that pervert bill cosby used to say pull up your pants <laughs> i was like yeah you should have pulled up your pants you said yeah, like, right, telling young black men to pull up their pants i'm gonna start wearing mine sloppy i'm gonna start, yeah. I'm gonna start wearing my, get away my with pants. It, yeah gonna you're gonna you're gonna have to see like uh this much underwear before you get to see <laughs> you know the, the top of the jeans that's what that's i'm gonna do. To do i can't see you <laughs> imagine i'm also thinking about it like that would look so ridiculous. I'd love to see a dad pay money. <laughs> oh my God. All right. Now, while we're comparing countries, this is very important. Um, Mark, apparently Leanne has a list of the 12 countries that have the worst food. The worst oh. food. Okay, okay. 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 This is interesting because I've seen some people eat some weird things on social media. I'm like, would I eat the slime that you're showing mm. me, showing off to me here in Tokyo or wherever you are? So I'm very interested to see this. Very yeah. good. Let's let's do it. Let's let's find out. Leanne, who are the worst countries when it comes to food? Okay, so these were this was actually put together by a bunch of foodies, food, traveling traveler blogs, bloggers. What? <laughs> Blogging travelers. <laughs> let's call them that. Um, so one of them, and these aren't in a, a particular order. So I didn't uh, again. I tried to find out if it was like from one to twelve or not, but it starts off mm. with Scotland. With a beautiful picture of some uh, haggis there. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. Um, the one foodie said, Scottish cuisine is basically based off a dare. Um, with options such as haggis, which is made from the liver, heart, and lungs of sheep. And something called crappet hide. Crappet spelled C-R-A-P-P-I-T. That sounds crap revolting. Mm. <laughs> Is this literally crap in the name? Well, I, I thought so, but no. It's um, hollowed out and stuffed fish heads. Fish heads. Oh. Uh. Mm. But we know Scottish food is mainly potatoes, root vegetables, and then 
some part of the animal that you don't really want to always eat. Yeah, Sorry. listen, I don't I, that that Scandinavian shit. You know that we've spoken about that surströming stuff that they make, uh -huh. which is apparently the worst smelling stuff ever. Um, I, I'm not a big fan of things like pickled herring and. To me, that's not, uh, you, you shouldn't be eating that stuff. It's revolting. There's so much other stuff in the world that's better to eat. And I'm not the right guy to ask because I'm not a, a food tourist, right? I would not mm. go, I would not go to a country and then experiment by eating all their shitty stuff. I know what I like. I'm not interested yeah. in that. Stuff. Yeah, we, we know your take on, on, on food and experimenting with food. Definitely just avos and tomato for you, right? <laughs> Mm, yeah, so those Scandinavians are right out. So they're in the in the category of worst food. So at least I know I'm not alone in thinking that they're rubbish. No, so yeah, they're on the list. Uh, there's Norway on the list. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, absolutely beautiful to visit, but yeah. not but a primary draw for foodies. Yeah, um, they've got some simple and hearty dishes like lutefisk and rackfisk. Um, but they've also got Again. that. They're salmon. Again, gross, like dried. Imagine, Mark, imagine biltong, but made out of fish. Yeah, that's what I'm hearing is what the problem is. There's too much fish, guys. <laughs> well, too we much. get tuna biltong here, which is oh. actually quite nice. Oh, really? Is it? Yeah. I've never had tuna biltong. Actually, I like them each separately. I just couldn't imagine them together. The problem is like the curing and the things that they do with it. Like in Norway, they also have something called sour cream porridge. But apparently, yeah. it's a lot better than it sounds. So don't uh, stick, mm. stick your nose up at it. Uh, I think I'd give sour cream porridge a go. I like oh. porridge. I'd give it a go. I mean, I, I'm not saying I think it would be my favorite breakfast cereal, but I'd I'd, I'd try it. Because some of these I wouldn't even try. Like that fish head with stuffing in it. I don't know what it was stuffed in, but it just, yeah, it's, it sounded like crap to me. <laughs> Quite literally. Bro, yeah. Okay, give us some other countries. Let's stop beating up on Norway. Kazakhstan makes the list, of course. Oh, right. What do they eat um, there? Handfuls of gravel? They, <laughs> um, they, this is uh, one foodie who's actually married to a woman from Kazakhstan. He says, I'm not a fan of boiled meat, especially if it's horse, fermented horse milk, or dried fermented milk. He says, uh, there are a few dishes that are okay. There is some decent food while visiting Kazakhstan, but mostly you'll eat, you'll go to restaurants, you'll go to like an Italian restaurant, you won't eat the local cuisine. Mm. Yeah, so not great there. Uh, who else do we have here? Remember earlier you said England would make the list, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Definitely. No one, no one has ever, no one ever woken up on any given day and gone, you know, I really feel like some English cuisine today. I mean, they nailed the breakfast. The number five. They nailed the breakfast. I think we all like a good bacon and you eggs. Know you know what? You make a fair point there. I hadn't even thought about it. But an English mm. breakfast, yeah, that's probably about right. That's the only thing that I think they can really claim. Mm, I agree. I agree. This warm beer shit is not for me. But they, oh, you know God. what? They've got some of the best chefs in the world, who, but they don't cook English cuisine. So, yeah, I mean, we're talking about the cuisine. One person sums it up as, they spent centuries conquering the world in search of spices and decided to not use any of them. <laughs> <laughs> right. But listen, they've got a good fish and chips, I have to say that. Yo, actually, England is fighting here. Fish and chips is good too. You can have that for lunch. Yeah, exactly. We're just missing dinner. Uh, Rush yeah. is on the list. I remember when, and, and it's so weird because this blogger says, as a seven-year-old kid, I went to Russia for the summer with my family and proceeded to eat only cookies for the duration. I thought I was being picky, but a lot of foodies agree with the seven-year-old me. Um, the bread is good, but others, <laughs> other dishes like chicken feet in jello just don't go down well. <laughs> yes, so and, and it's strange, my, my, my cousin um, trained as a gymnast in Russia when she was a little girl, and she went over with her trainer, and mm -hmm. you end up staying at the um your hosts houses so you don't stay in hotels or anything like that and the one night she went to the loo where there was some kind of bucket behind the toilet that had some something something floating in it and in red liquid okay and wow. they had dinner and when she went back to the loo afterwards that bucket was gone <laughs> 
Oh, what do you think it was? It was probably an animal organ of some sorts. Oh, no. And they had it for dinner? And it had come from the bathroom. Wow, that's rough. Yo. Oh, not good. Not good. Mm, okay. There's a country I found, I was quite surprised it was on the list, is the Philippines. Um, I, You know, I'm a big MasterChef Australia fan. Yes. And they often do a lot of amazing Philippine dishes. Um, but apparently it's more about the inconsistency. So wherever you go, if you think, oh, I really love this dish, I'm going to order it, it's going to be cooked differently in every single restaurant. There's no consistency because it's like family recipes. Um, and then one Filipino men person mentions they have salted pork blood stew and oh. sweet spaghetti with Vienna sausages. You know what? If anyone woke up this morning feeling hungry, that's not going to be there anymore. That's gone. So gone. No, no, it's good. It's good. We'll all be thin by tonight. Nobody's going to eat. Sausages, like, do they dry up pork blood, like pig blood? But listen, you, you said you liked in English breakfasts. That's one of the things on there. Or bacon. No, blood sausage. Oh, is no, it? No, no, no. We don't include that in what we think of as an English no, breakfast, no. right? Oh, okay. yeah, I've, never, I've never ordered a blood sausage at Wimpy before. <laughs> but yeah, um, I was just very interested in what that actual substance feels like because it sounds like dried blood, <laughs> like literally of the pig yeah. itself. Uh, Sugar Shabalala says, you should attend Isangoma ceremonies. I bet in South Africa it'll make the list. <laughs> That's the thing. You know That's the thing. There's a lot of traditional food going here around here that would make it onto this list. Sugar oh. Chavalala is right. I won't even lie, Leah. Yeah, it's very true. I'll, I'll probably even I'm saying something controversial here, but it's like for me, Malamukhoru is also is not the one. And people yeah. love it in our cultures, you know. It's, it smells bad. It, well, it tastes it tastes all right, actually, to be honest with you. But there's just so many things that I'd rather have, like, the Western version of. Like, even our beer, I'm going with it. It's mm. cool. It's traditional. But can I have a cost of light, please? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, you know what? I have no qualms about saying I'm not attached to any of that crap. And I don't want some food journey. Uh, I really do yeah. know what I like. And I'm just not experimental with food. Um Someone was cooking tripe once, uh, mm. and I smelt it, uh, and I was like, "You know what? There's no way I'm ever going to try that. Just not interested. Not at all." And yeah, the same that's goes for, just off-putting. Same yeah. goes for walkie-talkies. Same goes for mohodu. Same goes for all of that stuff. Not interested. Thank you very much. I love that you call them walkie-talkies. Yeah, yeah. You're allowed. You're allowed whatever you want. I'm. I'm just not interested. Thank you. Don't, and don't. I'm just saying where I have to be rude and say no thank you don't make me go to a restaurant where they only have that sort of shit on the menu um, I'm, not, I'm not keen yeah, thank you not for me um, an interesting one though was Mongolia so this is Mongolian people are traditionally nomadic so they're moving around a lot right so their diet consists mostly of dairy products, meat, and animal animal fats because they're taking mm. these animals along with them. They're herds of animals. But there's like zero grains and zero vegetables. And it makes sense because growing grains and vegetables would require you to stay in a place for a certain amount of time in one place right. in order to grow them. Um, so they basically just eat everything that comes from animals, um, nothing else. So a little bit boring. Um, Australia made the list because, I mean, even though their food is often compared to British food, um, there are sorts of things as kangaroo meat. There's also, they have, they've gone after this thing that they, they do in the Netherlands, which is sprinkling like hundreds and thousands on toast for breakfast. <laughs> that's that's kind of breakfast? Odd. Yeah, kind of odd. Spaghetti on toast, yeah. very Australian. And uh, one foodie says the Australian barbecue, which doesn't hinge on the flavors of a marinade or dry rub, but on how uh, well burnt the meat is. He says, we just take quality meat and burn it well. <laughs> I'm so oh. glad Australia's brides are shit. Another thing that we're better than them at. Yeah. yeah. I just, I, I can't, I can't, maybe I'm ridiculous here, but I find it very offensive when someone overcooks meat. I was talking to a friend of mine at a bry a couple of weeks ago. We were like, you know what? M my mother, for some reason, she likes to have the meat well done. 
There are people who like that. They don't like the bloody uh, pink inside the meat. But I just think that's such a waste. It's such an insult to a good steak to overcook it. You don't want to mm. do that, right? Yeah. yeah. Do you have it rare, though? I, I do medium rare. I don't know what you do. You know, no, yeah. medium rare is good. Medium rare is fine. But just rare, not... I can't take rare. Like, too much blood is not, is not a thing for me. No, I'm with you. But, but like, if you burn the thing, if it's completely burnt, that's just not on. That's yeah, terrible. I judge, I judge well done people the same way I judge people who put like four sugars in their coffee. <laughs> right. It's like, what happened to you? Like, you, you've been through stuff. <laughs> <laughs> On that note, you know, we've got Jane Malachi who, who kind of runs the place there at Cliff Central. Yes, yes, yes. I know Jane. I remember Jane. So Jane uh, always tells me when someone has too many sugars in their tea or coffee. And she told me that Tsepo, <laughs> who's now working for the podcast party, Tsepo is like a four sugar man. And I'm like, oh, shame. I, I wonder. Called, I him, yeah, I called him in the other day, and I'm like, dude, you have to stop this. It's going to kill you. <laughs> You'll right? find his dad wasn't around. His mom beat him. Like it was just. I know. The sugar it's outrageous. Thing. <laughs> oh, it's outrageous. It's really. It's not on. So something something happened in his life that he needs yeah, to uh, for sure, eat. For uh, sure. Drink that much sugar in his coffee. It's not on at all. And I judge. I do judge people. <laughs> I'll judge you. I'll judge you for overcooking the meat and for having too many sugars. I'm glad you brought that one up. Very good. We've got two more on the list. Should I do them? Yeah, I want to hear. Are these the extra shitty ones? Are these the ones that like? Are they ranked or is it just? A That's list the of thing. Ten? I couldn't figure out if they were ranked, but to me, it sounds like we're we're probably getting to number one at the right point. This is number two. Oh, yeah. I wouldn't have been so harsh on the Netherlands by putting them in there. They also do the bread with margarine and sprinkles. Um, but then the rest of their cuisine is mainly pickled fish, different types of pancakes, deep fat fried foods, yeah. and uh, a normal kind of day-to-day -day, uh, meal is boiled potatoes, boiled vegetables, a piece of overcooked meat, and some packaged gravy. That's what Dutch kids eat from about five to five days of the week. Mm. And on, on the other packaged days, it's gravy. literally bread for dinner. And on a Sunday, you'll probably be eating fries and some other deep fried snacks. Not very healthy. Sure. Okay. And then leading us to the last one is North Korea, which let's face it, how many of us are ever going to have North Korean cuisine in our lives? <laughs> Hardly anyone. <laughs> well, no one, no one, you, you, it's very difficult to get in there in the first place. But then, I mean, I've heard that they don't have a lot of protein there, so they, they have to eat whatever they can get. Prison food, basically. Yeah. So as this blogger says, while South Korean food is delicious, North Korean food can be seen to be more lacking. If you do if you do still go there, you can look forward to dishes such as cold noodles and dog meat soup. Yeah. Dog meat soup. <laughs> That's about yeah, it. I think, uh, I think you can count me out of that one too. So, all right. Basically, I should just stay at home. I shouldn't go anywhere. Yeah, man. We do have it going on. We do have going going on here in South Africa. We do have good food. We have good booty. Like, what else do you need? <laughs> good weather. It's going on. If we, I really don't think you have to leave. And that was also one of the themes of the Commies Choice was actually we were celebrating South Africa. That was one of the biggest things that Pop Pops was mentioning is how awesome it actually is to be South African. I think we truly do have one of the best countries in the world, even though it's a bit lawless. I think that's also fine. Like we've all been stopped by the cops, but none of us have gone to jail. So <laughs> I mean, we'll take it when we can. You know? No, no one really goes to jail in this country, so that's a yeah, good reason. Yeah, but we, we all commit the crime, you know. We all we all have been stopped by those guys. But they actually, my problem with them is they're actually becoming bullies. Who the cops? Yeah, because they know we're willing to pay them, so they actually use it against but, us. I think this is probably a good place for you to tell us about when you were um, you were almost like ripped off by a con artist, and we were talking about this <laughs> earlier on because we spoke about yeah. those two guys in Port Elizabeth who were killed. Uh, they went oh, into Motherwell by okay. TV. Yeah, yeah. yeah, I heard about them. So what happened to you? Oh, yeah. Well, it's, it's actually quite a long story. So um, I went out and then afterwards, my friends decided to go to Monte Casino because they wanted to gamble. So I was like, okay, I'll, mm -hmm. I'll go with you. And um, we went there and I met somebody while I was there who seemed quite interesting. Like there was drama around her, like it looked like she was carining. Um, talking about she got locked in the bathroom and her finger got cut and the casino owes her. And I, I'm bored, like I've, I've blown my money, I've given up. So 
<laughs> I go and I talk to her and then turns out she's in entertainment, right? And uh, naturally, I start speaking to her about the stuff that I do. Um, she's like, send me a link to all your work. And then I go, I check out on, on LinkedIn. She's legit. I send her my um, links for like the TV show that I was on, even some Cliff Central podcast that we did. And so she wait, absolutely is, it, is there like them. some kind of um, romantic connection that you're interested no, in? No, not Just really. Like so we both found out like we're in the industry. Mm -hmm. So then we got off of that and like what we want to do and these goals that we want to achieve. And I'll tell you now that looking back, because it didn't actually happen a long time ago. It was like a week, two weeks ago. So I'm still actually reeling from the experience. But looking back, I can tell that I was living in her delusion. So she had her own three-story house in Bryanston, which had glitter balls in every level. The bottom floor was for entertainment. The middle one was for work. The top one was for casual. And like she invited me and two band members that I play music with. They came. Uh, they, he, she said, we must come and have a sleepover. We packed bags and everything. Like she spoke so eloquently. She, she said all of the right things. And like she kind of aligned me with all the dreams that I've had. I don't know how, but it's almost like she knew me or knew how to play me rather. So, so you pack bags like the next day. Or no, no, no. So the, the story continues um, from, from that casino. So we had a meeting uh, like a two days later, three days later at the Panerotti's about what we wanted to do. Because she's serious about being a brand strategist and placing me in movies. Uh -huh. She's telling me about putting me in movies like with Alan Baldwin as a voiceover artist because I also send her some voiceovers. I was like, I'm getting excited. She was saying that I'm going to go meet up with Joe Rogan for a podcast. I was like, oh my wow. God, I have made it. So we were supposed <laughs> to we were supposed to meet with her. She even came to one of my comedy shows. She really did. Mm. So like, this is the thing about con artists, like they play this fine line. It's really fine, but there's always this loose stuff around them that you're like, this either sounds too good to be true or really dodgy. You know, it's, yeah. it's hard to explain. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, came to our college show, but gave me all these promises. Like she asked me to borrow a hundred rand when she didn't have money and she was going to give me two pick and pay vouchers for 2,500 rand. I still haven't seen one of those vouchers. Then we we're supposed to meet one time. And then her assistant passed away. Oh, now we can't meet. And now it's obviously really sad. And as a normal human being, you're going to go, oh, I'm so, so sorry. This is so, so tragic. Yeah. Let's skip this. And you're going to next you're gonna leave her alone. You're going to leave her alone for a bit so she can yeah, deal with But she's all pushing this agenda. Yeah, she's pushing yeah. this agenda. She's like, let's meet the next day. And it's like, no, actually, my heart is broken. I can't meet. So she cancels that meeting. Then she was supposed to come to a show that I'd organized. And then she's like, no, I'm actually still going through this. And I'm like, you know what? Actually, we're actually starting to lose a little bit of faith here. And then she's like, how dare you? Like, she kind of got defensive. And then that was when she organized the sleep overnight at her three-story mansion, supposedly. Now it's mm -hmm. me and the band members, we've packed our bags, we're ready to go. And now she's coming from Pretoria. She's just been in an accident with an Uber. We were like, oh, yeah. okay, so we're supposed to have this sympathy now. It's also like, it, it, it almost forces you to be an asshole if you go, oh, I don't believe it. So I just kept quiet. And then um, I was waiting to see what her response would be. Haven't heard a thing from her since. So, I don't even know what her agenda was. It feels like to me she was practicing on me. So anyway, we because <laughs> we Googled her and then she does have like counts of, uh, I don't know what they call it, con artistry against her. Um, she was oh, even really? on Art Blanche. And yeah, oh. so I won't give the name, but yeah, she was, she was there. There were articles about it. Okay, so basically oh, yeah. she's a, she's a full-time bullshit artist. And it, yes. what, what you think along the way she would have been trying to get money out of you or something? Well, she she tried to get that 100 rand, which wasn't much, and she paid it back. So I don't know. That's what I mean. Like, she was practicing on me because um, this, this, she wasn't getting millions from me. Let's just say that. Um, yeah. But it feels like to me that it was just a way for her to practice her craft. Here's this young, vulnerable man with a dream. Let's see how long. <laughs> let's see how far I can take it. Let's see how much he'll believe. She was eventually going to say, we're gonna, I'm going to be on stage with Kevin Hart, and I'll be like... Yeah, I can't wait. Uh, Carl, Carl wants to know, says, Mark, was this woman attractive? I bet she was hot. Hot women will make you believe anything. Be careful. <laughs> if this woman was ugly, tell me this would have gone down the same way. Uh, I don't know. She was much, much older than me. So I wouldn't say hot, but you can see back in the day, maybe. Um, but to be honest, we really did connect on the fact that we had this dream and this vision. It's like, oh my God, we're in entertainment. And like, yeah, obviously I've wanted 
to do this for so long. Somebody's giving me all these opportunities on a silver platter, supposedly. Apparently, she lives half her life in Dubai, half her life in South Africa. She was going to fly me out mm. to Dubai. And I was going to stay at the Serenia, which is one of the most beautiful places in Dubai. So, like, in my head, I think she has this ideal life that she wishes that she had. Because it's, like, all the best of everything. Three-story house, the best podcast in the world, the Serenia, the most beautiful place in the world, you know, is these almost ridiculously unbelievable things that she had. Let me, let me ask you a couple of questions. How is this oh. any different? I mean, so maybe this woman is just living in a total delusion and a fantasy. Yes, that's right? my opinion. And, and she, to her, the adventure is that she goes out, she meets young guys, she like entices them. She's playing a game. There's no real payoff. It's yeah. just a fantasy. It's just a fantasy. She's living some kind of life she doesn't actually have any access to. She's projecting 100%. her desires about what she'd like the world to be like. And you were just an accessory to her dream that night. Yeah, I really was. I feel that it is exactly it. Is just every time, every time I look back and I remember another thing about it, I'm like, this was I was literally in somebody's dream. You know, like somebody's you know, made I mean, up scenarios. For her also, the fact that she paid back the hundred rand, either it means that she was lining you up for a much bigger amount later on. And this is yeah. a way for it to build trust. Because you like. I gave her the hundred bucks, but she paid me. Yeah. She paid me back. But also so, just weird. That's what I mean about the, the fine line that they walk. She really no. like, I, I trusted her to some degree. Yeah. And then, you know, later on, there'll be more money and she might not pay it back. Mm. Um, that's the one and thing. I have that to have this in, if I want to fly to Dubai and all yeah. this. I, don't, I didn't want to go there. Once she didn't respond, because she said in the Uber accident, she got a wrist injury and a head injury, but she's fine. The Uber driver yeah. had to go to the hospital. And I was like, okay. okay. Sounds like a lot of shit. If I were you, I'd delete her number. There's no good that can come of this. Yeah. It feels crazy, though, because you hear about these stories, and then until it's you, it's like, it's, it really felt like a movie. The moment anyone sells you a dream, and it sounds too good to be true, it is too good to be true. Just run a mile. Mm. No, I hear you. I hear you. It's just, yeah. You want, you, sometimes when you want something really badly, you'll believe anything. All right. It's interesting to hear a story of... A, a, an older woman doing this to a younger guy, though. Mm. Yeah, I mean, usually yeah, it's the other way around. The other way around. <clears throat> Some man selling big dreams. Um, uh, you know, oh, the Jeffrey Epstein, the world. Hollywood story. <laughs> yeah, right. Um, no, I um, get you. Kind of preying on on people who really want to succeed. Mm, mm, mm. But jeez, what a woman! Wow. I mean, like, she's it's impressive. Gonna, she's going to carry on doing what she's doing. No, of course. It was impressive. Like, looking back, I'm like, you are so good at this. Like, <laughs> you should carry on. But the amount she was working to do or to put up this facade, she might as well put in following her dreams and making them real. Like, she could get a three-story yeah. house with how good she is. <laughs> at like, just believe in yourself. <laughs> you, would, you would think that she would be, she'd be chasing down. I mean, like, she's clearly an ambitious person. She has high hopes and dreams for herself. Mm. But she has no idea of how to get there. So instead, she just plays these fantasy games. Also, yeah. be careful about the people you meet in casinos, generally. <laughs> you know, mean, <laughs> that was actually, when I look back, I kept going like, yeah. But you know, okay, this is my problem with that, is that I find myself a, a decent person. And I go to places, I go to bars, I go to casinos, I go to all these places. And I hope that there's normal people there too. Like, I find it hard to believe that everywhere you go, the people there are fucked up. I really don't like that idea. Surely no. I can find a normal person there as well. Because then that means that I'm just fucked up. And it's like, there's no hope for any of us. Because I'm just living life, you know. I think, I think I, like, I if you go people. to if you go to a casino, you're going to meet people who either are just, and this is the rare category. There's like, out of all the people you meet in a casino, maybe 5% of them are these people that are going there just to have fun. They're going to have a little flutter, gamble a little bit. They've, they've, they've got their limit for the night. They're just doing it because it gives them a bit of a thrill. I understand that. That's a, yeah. a rare group among the, the, the whole group, right? The rest of them are desperate people who are hoping to hit it lucky because they hu owe huge amounts of money. They're in massive debt. They're miserable. Their lives are shit. They think money will help solve their problems. I, yeah, I, 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 remember, like, I was I was very astonished by the people that you see there. Firstly, the amount of people and even the types of people. I saw like old mamas in there gambling for their lives. And I was like, yo, you, I'd never picture you in a casino at this time doing what you're doing. You know, even with the ZCC Indeed. bag and everything, walking. <laughs> Spending their pension. It crazy. It's, it's very, very sad. But listen, uh, I suppose uh, th th this might have occurred to you once or twice before, but I thought about it the other day. I thought, 
if everyone in South Africa had to suddenly get, let's say a million rand, that's a lot of money, right? A million bucks. If everyone in this country suddenly woke up and they had a million rand that they didn't have the day before, I wonder how long it would take for them to end up exactly in the situation they're in mm. before yeah. the million rand. Because I have, have a, a show on, on how I lost my millions, remember? Yeah, I know. And those shows prove my point. I reckon it would take a couple of days and everyone would be right back where they started. So if you see people today and you think, hmm, that person would be better off with a million rand, just imagine how quickly they'd be back to exactly where they were. Because that's the ugly reality, right? No one wants to talk about this because we think if we just gave people money, they'd be happier, their problems would go away, they'd, uh, they'd, they'd, they'd sort their problems out, they'd deal with their, their, their debts, they'd pay for their bills that they couldn't afford up to now, they'd fix their house up, they'd, you know, they'd, they'd sort out their CV, they'd get their shit together. The reality is, though, for most people, if you gave them a million bucks, they would actually be right back where they started in no time. Yeah, I agree with that. I think the first problem is that people don't know how to use their money, firstly. So even if they have it, it's like, okay, well, I'm just going to do what I usually do and hopefully more comes. Um, mm -hmm. I think a lot of people don't realize that money builds on top of money. But that's a, yeah, that's an entirely different conversation in terms of the education people have around money but socially as well south africa is like it's a very loose country very free people love to drink <laughs> so i think people will be stacking bottles having parties like it'll be a celebration we'd make a public holiday for it and it'd be good times but yeah i think a month max if you talk about a million i think a month somebody would buy a car that's already actually your money's gone now <laughs> because there's no car under a million rand no new car really no, re and everybody's going to want an Audi. You won't know how to finance it. So I say a car, it's a few bottles, and yeah, that's your money gone. Yeah, the only people who'd make money out of uh, an extra million for everybody in this country are the liquor companies. Yeah, you know. <laughs> exactly. So, and they're right, fine. Um, they, they do well in this country. Azalea says the casino is the red flag for that person <laughs> you met. Um, Luando says in Cape Town, you go to Grand West Casino to meet addicted casino people. You go um, there to meet them. Why would you want to go meet them? Like, what are you, well, you going to do? If you wanted to meet them. Uh, oh, Super Bowl okay. Bill says, uh, Lotto has stats on this. Most winners end up with nothing or are heavily indebted within a few years of winning. Yeah. I think it's like that prison thing, like where if you've been for, to prison for so long, it's hard for you to be out. Mm. It's like, it's just what you know. Yeah. Yeah. And a lot of people are in money prison. That's the truth. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it, money's it, a mind fuck. Yeah, and and it won't help. You can give them ten million, and they'll still fuck it up, and they'll yeah. be back to zero soon. So you got to really think about it before you start wondering, like, oh, I'd love to win the lottery, and you start fantasizing about being rich. You got to think very carefully, like, how long do you think it would take you to end up exactly back where you started? Because sometimes there's no amount that's enough, and for some people, they would have no idea how to manage any of it. Mm. Yeah, I I saw a, a clip once on someone saying if you had to take all the wealth in the world so mm -hmm. if you think about the the few multi-billionaires that there are with their super jets and i mean you know like yachts and if you had to take all the money in the world and divide it up equally between the population of the world um how much would it be and that's a difficult figure to get to although it shouldn't be too difficult I suppose someone else can someone out there can do it but I, I reckon the same would happen is that those who were billionaires before would probably make money off of the little bit that they now had. Mm -hmm. And those who spent terribly and had no um, like economic background would probably be poor again. Yeah. So then all the talk about equality is just nonsense, right? Oh, yeah. that's, a, that's a deep point there. There's no such thing as equality, just putting it out no, there. No, there's... There absolutely is not. Yeah, all right, but there, yeah. are some no, other things, uh, there are some other things. It's not the, to prove my point almost. Saudi Arabia, you know, they wanted to build that um, the line, which is that that long thing through the desert. They would put hotels and housing, and, uh, shops apartments, and, yeah, everything into this amazing development. And everybody has been touting it as the most spectacular thing that human beings will build in the next ten to twenty years. And people have been talking about it. So apparently. They are scaling back, surprise, surprise.
their ambitious 170-kilometer-long linear city known as the Line, initially designed to accommodate 9 million residents and cost $1.5 trillion. It is now expected to be significantly smaller, covering only 2.4 kilometers and housing only 300,000 people by 2030. This decision comes amidst uncertainties about the budget. Uh, you see, even for rich countries like Saudi Arabia, that you think unlimited money, even they have to scale back on these things. So apparently it's um, going to be a massive shift from the original grandiose uh, vision of, of the, the the prince, Mohammed bin Salman. Apparently the line was intended as a high-tech glass-walled city connected by a high-speed rail line, symbolizing Saudi Arabia's push towards modernization and economic transformation. However, with the downsizing of the project, there are reports of contractors letting go of workers reflecting the adjustments that are taking place in the ambitious development. So if Saudi Arabia has to scale back, you know what? You can live within your budget too. <laughs> yeah, I guess it goes to show it doesn't matter how much money you have. You there's always more. You know, I think that 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 would be that would be my problem because I have no experience being rich yet. But I think I'd always want more. But I think like I'll work to get it. But if I have a nice car, I want two nice cars. And then I want three nice cars. And then I want the garage. And then I want the big house. You know, is this this is almost always more. So yeah. Christian Voigt has done a little calculation there for us. I wonder yeah. if Here it is. Uh, if the wealth of all billionaires wow. which is a number that I can't say and I might <laughs> zoom her it up. So I'm just listen gonna, properly. I'm just gonna keep quiet. Um if it was distributed equally amongst the world's population, each person would receive approximately in dollars one thousand seven hundred and sixty-seven dollars twenty-seven cents. Okay, which is a it's about thirty-five thousand rand. So oh everyone in South Africa would get thirty-five thousand rand if all the billionaires' money was distributed uh, equally ar around the world. Everyone here Don't would get the capitalism. So well, I mean, thirty-five thousand is not going to change anyone's life forever. Okay, it might make a difference now, but it's not going to change anyone's life forever. So that's an interesting idea. When people are obsessed with the rich and taxing the rich and the rich must pay their fair share, you hear this a lot from politicians, all it would do, if you absolutely liquid, liquid, li liquidated, I almost said liquefied, if you liquidated them, this is what mm. you'd get. 35,000 rand each in the world. That's not going to change the world. Sorry. It would be interesting to ask um, like an Elon Musk of the world, if he only was worth, um, how, what did we say, thirty five thousand rand? Yeah. How he would grow that? Hmm. Well, we know for a fact that he was worth less than that once. We know for a fact that he was in huge debt once. He owed more than he had, and he built something out of less than nothing because it was in the negative. So, yes, he would find a way to do it again. I'm pretty sure. <laughs> Yeah, investments. That's that's the best way to do it. I think just put it in something that actually makes money. Um, and by the way, uh, that poor lovely dad. lady, lovely lady Lee says that's thirty five k on top of my current salary. Nice, yeah, but only for one month. You wouldn't get that every month. Yeah, so it's it be a one off payment, and it's not going to, Lady Lee, it's not going to change your life forever, right? It might make a difference for your payments for one month, but like otherwise, wake up. It's not. That's not enough. It really is. In the mining town that I live, local mine had an investment scheme for their employees. They paid out 500,000 Rand per employee before tax to all the employees, even the cleaners. It did not go well at all, says Azania. Mm -hmm. So you see, again, don't think that that's going to change uh, the universe for you. It's like you're still going to be a disaster with money after you've been given all of this money. It's crazy. <laughs> all right, well, What's going on with you, Mark? Give us a little update because we hardly we hardly really ch chatted about you this morning. We talked about how you were almost scammed. We talked about <laughs> terrible food. But what's been going on with you? Like, where where can people see you? Are you going to be performing, doing stand up somewhere soon? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, things have actually been good uh, of late, which is something to be grateful for in the entertainment industry because it's still rough, Gareth. I know we talk about it very often, but sure. um, I'm literally performing in restaurants at the moment because that's basically the comedy scene in Johannesburg. Um, wow. There's still no comedy club, so there's still no set structure. 
Um, people are just running gigs throughout the city. But it's cool because I'm getting booked as a host. I perform at Josie Gin very, very often. Um, but my biggest thing at the moment is me and my band. We really are getting into a stride because I don't know, a lot, a lot of people don't know that I do music as well. Um, I just actually consider myself an artist in general. I just like, I have too much shit to say. <laughs> That's the, the truth yeah. about it. So yeah, we've been performing a lot. Yesterday I played at LSB, which is like one of the things I've always wanted to do as a musician. Like we did comedy there when it was still Beer House years and years ago. Uh, yeah. but yesterday I performed there as a singer for the first time, which is really cool. Because uh, I, I like that place too well uh, sometimes. I saw you there actually once upon a time. Yeah, um, yeah it's amazing. It dude. So, so you, you performed there as, a, as an artist, as a singer. Yes, yes, yes. So oh, there's good. another artist, Lavinga Dennis, she's from Namibia, and we've worked together a little bit. But yeah, my band and I were called Two Clipper, uh, which I'm sure you, I don't know if you know what that means. No, you'll have to give me context. Really? Yeah. Okay, so South Africa has different nicknames for our money. Okay. You yes, do know yes, that, yes. right? Like if we start at five bop, that's 50 cents. Yeah. And then you go to five rand, it's called a half tiger. And then a 10 rand is a tiger or a jacket. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> that was my favorite one. I don't know why it's called a jacket, but a 10 rand is a jacket. And then 20 rand is a choco. Mm -hmm. 50 okay. rand is a pinkies. Mm. 100 rand is a clipper. And 200 rand is? Two clippers. Two clipper, <laughs> yeah. So... Yeah, that's the that's the name of our band. We released our first single recently. It's called Koloi. It's about getting drunk and needing an Uber at the end of the night. And you can't call it yourself. So <laughs> you have to get one of your friends to call it for you. Um, <laughs> so that was pretty exciting, like doing that on Spotify. Because it's really scary. Because like as a musician, you just measure yourself up to all these incredible musicians and artists that you know yeah. all the time. So you almost don't give yourself that space to be an amateur or a rookie. So it was it was really relieving to hear the response from the song. We have like 25 monthly listeners now and it hasn't even been a month. Imagine imagine that by the end of the month. Um, so Very yeah, cool. it's it's nothing yet, but it's it's something. It's something big to us. And yeah, it's been really good. We've been performing every week. That's Sorry? very, very, that's very good. I like that. That's excellent. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, I'll, I'll use any outlet I can to, I don't know, I was saying on Facebook the other day, like, no matter how many art forms I use, I can never really quite say it. I think as artists, we're all looking to connect to source, to that thing, to the reason why we're all here or um, to celebrate that or hate it, actually. But it's just, yeah, it's just one of the ways that I can... Well, uh, TL TL's busy stalking you on LinkedIn of all places. Nice <laughs> LinkedIn profile, Mark. I see you studied politics at Rhodes. Oh yes, politics and philosophy. Get it right. Mm, well, not just good. the hat track. <laughs> and then Sibongo uh, Kutle says, "I love me a clipper." Hey, yes, I, I love too. I want the highest currency in the land. That's that's what, <laughs> partly why we call it to keep. I see the next question is why would you? Uh, what's the story behind the band name? Is uh, we okay? So it started with two of us, and we were just searching for a name that we wanted to be very South African, very local. Because I'm black, and the lead guitarist is white, so we have this like Nelson Mandela did his job thing going on you know so we wanted to be <laughs> <laughs> like he nailed it let's be honest he did he did we're pretty yeah, free sure. which is pretty dope so we wanted to celebrate that idea and two clippers is just very very south african and it also means high quality because the music is also very different it's like it's they ask what us kind of music is it what do you what so do you guys say covers we call it acoustic folk rap we don't, I don't think that a genre exists, but basically it's because it's two acoustic guitars. Um, Scott plays the lead, I play the, uh, the rhythm guitar. And uh, we, also, we also have a drummer, his name is Baron. And then it's kind of folksy, like it's very deep. The lyrics are rooted in love and pain and melancholy. And then I rap sometimes. <laughs> so it just makes things, acoustic folk rap. But yeah, it's, this, you can't really explain it. Our best, we're best live. If I'm being honest, I love it. That sounds amazing. All right, so yeah, we can yeah, see yeah. you performing. We must just follow you on social media, and then we'll find out where everything is. Yeah, or follow me in real life. I prefer it if you come to real shows because uh, me, I'm a I'm a big social media beef guy. Like I do post all my shows there, but I don't really like post videos and stuff like that because I want people to come out. I feel like we're in a time now where people don't go out to do things anymore because it's so easy to just watch it on your phone and you kind of get the same. 
result in inverted commas. But I think the fun is going out and getting dressed and mm. going to meet people and be yeah. in a social scenario that is memorable. It's always a good time. Like I've never gone Thank to a show you. and been like, that was shit. Don't be, a boring, uh, don't be a boring asshole who just sits home, home the whole time and like me. Uh, rather go out. <laughs> Like, yeah, go out and do shit. We're, we're back. We're alive, guys. Come and see us. Comedy is still alive and kicking. The comedians that are coming up are absolutely fantastic. Like, we're doing the thing. We just need people to come back out again and then obviously try to rebuild this industry as well, which comics are really trying to do. I really do see that. But um, yeah. yeah, what no, was definitely. the name of that cool, cool comedy club? Like 20 years ago, no, it was Parker's Comedy Club and it wasn't 20 years ago. It closed uh, due to COVID. So, yeah, it's... Um, Oh, I see lack of music. Thank you, Ellen Duplessis. Yay, we're doing it, we're doing it. You see, just hearing stuff like that is so cool because Very before nice. we released on Spotify, we knew we were good as a band, but people always ask us, like, where can we listen to your music? We're like, come to Rooms Live on Wednesday. For All right, listen, <laughs> we got to wrap this uh, fun up for this morning. We'll be back tomorrow morning at 6 a.m. bright and early. Have an excellent Monday, everybody. Thanks, Mark and Gluli. Thank you, Leanne Mole. We will see you tomorrow. Cheers, everyone. Thanks,